Welcome, welcome everybody to Master Naturalist Present, Indigenous Use of Fire, Impacts on the Landscape. We're excited to have Megan Peoples as our speaker today. Megan received her horticulture degree from Texas a and University. She is actively pursuing her master's research in ecological restoration in the Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources at Tarleton State University. <laughs> Megan is a chapter leader for the Texas Master Naturalist and serves on the executive board for the Native Plant Society of Texas. Audio. Audio. She has held positions at Texas A&M AgriLife Research and Texas Discovery Gardens, amongst others, where she helped to restore over 100 acres of native habitat on public land. Megan specializes in native Texas plants and their ecological interactions and is an active community speaker and advocate. Welcome, Megan, and uh, one final note for participants. Um, uh, Megan, okay, if you want to go ahead and add your chat, your questions to the chat as you think of them, uh, then we will um, we'll try to address those, um, and, but there will also be a question and answer time at the end, so either way. Okay. Awesome, thank you, guys. Um, so I'm Megan Peoples, and this is Indigenous Use of Fire. And if I could just ask everyone one more time to turn off their microphones and make sure you're muted, um, because sometimes it's really distracting hearing the feedback. Thank you so much. So let me make sure it's working, okay. So yes, as uh, Gregory and Matthew mentioned, uh, my name is Megan Peoples. I have a background in horticulture mostly, but I'm currently studying ecological restoration at Tarleton State University, um, where I teach some horticulture classes and do research uh, in environmental restoration and native grasslands. So I really became interested in fire as a way to do prairie restoration. Um, without grazing animals, it's one of the only ways to really maintain a uh, thatch buildup on the prairie and maintain a really healthy uh, grassland vegetation. So this past semester, I did some graduate research in, in uh, fire ecology and also got my wildland firefighter certification. Um, so it's always been an area of interest for me. And coming, you know, doing prairie restoration, you get to uh, learn a lot about the ecosystem dynamics of that kind of environment. And one of the interesting theories is that um, Native American people and indigenous people around the world practice burning regularly um, to maintain fire dependent ecosystems, optimize those habitats and also to promote biodiversity. So I really wanted to look into this area and to better understand um, how these actions had impacts on these environments. So a fire regime. A fire regime is the occurrence, frequency, and, and intensity of fire for, an given, for any given environment. Um, this is both natural, caused by uh, lightning strikes, and also human influenced. So humans have influence um, as far as prescribed burning goes. So prescribed burns are intentionally set controlled burns under ideal conditions. Uh, to maintain fuel loads in environments and promote ecosystem well-being. Um, the problem with suppression of fire in our ecosystems is that there's a buildup of fuel loads. So you can see here in the picture to the left that this forest ecosystem is full of shrubs and small trees and you can't see through it. A healthy forest ecosystem, you should be able to walk through and see through, and there should be a healthy flowering um, community at the base of the forest floor. That means that light is coming through, um, and when fire does come through, you're not going to have transference of that fire to a, a higher and more intense degree. So doing prescribed burns is really controlling fuel loads in the understory, but the suppression of fire leads to those buildups. And when you have buildups of fuel in the understory, you end up with wildfires. So wildfires are fires that are out of control and unmanageable, and this is something we really want to avoid. So in California, the historic, you know, we've been seeing tons of fires in California in the news. Um, but the historic average of acres burned in California before European settlement was actually 4.5 to 12 million acres per year. These were fires that occurred naturally and were also set by indigenous people. In the years from 1999 to 2017, 
Um, fire managers were only able to prescribe and conduct burns on 13,000 acres per year. So that is a dangerous lack of fires occurring. And as you can imagine, that is also a buildup of fuel loads. And this ended up leading to the 2020 wildfires, which were some of the worst wildfires in California history, where up to 12 million acres went back to burning, but they were wildfires instead of controlled fires. The same thing kind of occurred in Texas, as I'm sure a lot of you guys remember, after the 2011 drought. Um, one of the worst wildfires was in Bastrop, Texas, where 34,000 acres burned, including most of Bastrop State Park, where the adjunct and very special population of lost pines occurred. Um, this was also a surface fire that eventually transferred into the crowns of the trees. And that's when, you know, you're no longer um, helping the ecosystem, you're hurting it. Uh, so this was a complete loss of 100-year-old pine trees and also notably the understory of 350-year-old post oaks, the oldest known in North America. Um, so when you are having a fire that kills off 350-year-old trees, you can imagine that that fire was the worst in 350 years. So definitely something to think about. These kind of disaster level fire events are as you can imagine, really, really awful for the environment. So you're losing the complete dominant vegetation. Um, all that topsoil is eroding. All those nutrients are leaching. And you're experiencing disruption of nutrient cycles, disruption of water cycles. Um, and the plants that can return to this kind of disaster zone are weedy annual species, not the kind of desirable climax species that we're really after. So what can we learn from looking backwards? If we're having fire events that are the worst in 350 years, can we maybe you know, um, imagine that this might be a kind of European mindset and a European influence and a lost art of indigenous fire that maintain these ecosystems for so long and to such a healthy degree? Um, so anthropologists, have studied indigenous fire around the world and have identified over 70 unique uses by Native American people um, for fire in their cultures. Anything from road clearing and trail clearing uh, to, to ritual and signaling, um, fire was an integral part of daily life. Native Americans really saw fire as medicine. They practiced fire regularly um, at low intensities, um, so keeping that fire low and cool um, and over small areas, so that the most that they did was one hectare, you know, a few acres at most at a time. And that uh, provided kind of a mosaic pattern in the landscape that provided a lot of refuge and escape ground for wildlife. This is the type of fire that uh, really helps an ecosystem. It returns nutrients to the soil and promotes environmental well-being. So we can explore um, effects of fire in this, this tree ring cross section. So when you cut a tree in half, right, you can almost get a history of that tree and see what, it's, it, what it has experienced environmentally. So down here, you can see that this cross section started around the 1700s and went to the 1900s. <clears throat> so these, these thicker growth rings here, this is the annual growth between dark and light. Uh, these dark patches here um, along the bark that kind of go in, those are fire scars. So the fire scars are occurring about every 20 years um, on this particular tree. And you can see that um, because of those fire, the competition from other plants um, and the nutrient cycling, increased water, increased light, help this tree put on very robust growth layers. So you can see it's really, really thick and healthy until you get to about the 1850s to 1900s, um, you start seeing some rapid change, right? So the growth rings start becoming um, less robust, less growth is happening every year. And you also start seeing a warping of the growth rings on this tree that led to its death in eight, the 1970s here. So this is a tree that is experiencing regular burns and it's very healthy. And then the suppression of fire um, 
led to decreased growth, decreased immunity and health for this tree and its eventual death in the 1970s. So one of the notable features of pre-European settlement um, Appalachian forests and forests all over the United States um, was a notable composition of nut and food crop trees. I find this super interesting because this kind of points to a Native American legacy that they might have been cultivating food crops and food trees in their forests. So here you can see a hickory, um, a pine, uh, a pecan, and walnut. These are all very common old growth species in our forests, or you know, chestnuts were at one point too. Um, and, and these were food forests that were actually cultivated like orchards by Native American people. So these ancient groves, one of the most fascinating examples of ancient groves for me were the chestnut forests of um, the Eastern Appalachian forests. So at the time of European settlements, chestnuts um, were about 25% of the Eastern forests and they were huge, robust trees. These trees didn't start branching for up to 50 feet and were 600 year old. Um, you can see just how large these trees became. Unfortunately, um, so unfortunately, during about the 1904, I believe, is when chestnut blight came to the Americas and pretty much wiped out the entire population of uh, North American chestnuts with disease. So I have in my notes, so just I'm checking. Uh, but four, four billion trees um, were gone, sorry. Four billion trees that were around for 40 million years were gone in just 40 years. So you can see that, you know, something really changed in the history of those trees. So what can we learn from Native Americans about when to practice fire? In Texas, um, all of my studies of kind of the literature um, around the world. There were definitely certain times of year that were targeted for being the best times for burning. Um, in Texas, that's definitely late fall. So at late fall, when all the plants go into dormancy, there's a buildup of dead wood. So you do a light burn to clear out that dead wood, clear away undesirable species like green briar um, and things that you don't want, return those nutrients to the soil and help light uh, penetrate the forest floor and warm the ground. That's going to help you have more wildflowers in the understory, more vegetation. There's also a perfect time to burn in early spring um, at, at the kind of transition period between the winter grasses and the spring grasses. So your cool and warm season grasses. That's going to be before the blue bonnets come, right before then. Um, that's going to clear off all that standing vegetation, return those nutrients to the ground again, uh, reduce that competition, and allow for those prolific wild wildflowers events to occur, which Texas is so famous for. You also want to minimize your chances of wind, right? You can really imagine fire speed is intimately related to wind speed. So on the days where you have um, minimal wind velocity, you're gonna have uh, slower fires, more in control um, that you can really manage better. Another use of fire for indigenous people was for hunting. Um, there is a phenomenon called prairie peninsulas uh, that happen in our deciduous forests. And these were thought of being pretty mysterious kind of environmental occurrences because it was, it's a random patch of grassland in the forest. And we really don't understand um, what kind of environmental factors you know, promoted them. But one of the theories is that indigenous people actually burned these areas to create hunting grounds where uh, woodland deer and elk would come out of the woods to graze on these meadows and would afford them an opportunity to, um, to target those species. They would also use fire to drive these animals in and out of these areas. So fire was a, a regular occurrence already on the Great Plains that maintained uh, the vast grasslands of North America. Um, one of the factors of these environments is that they are, they're dry, they're subject to high heat um, and drought and wind, and it's a very connected ecosystem. So when a fire does occur, it burns for very long distances. 
Well, Native American people observed that um, bison herds and other grazing animals would come intentionally to areas that had been burned when um, the kind of lush regrowth of the grass was really um, palatable, easy to digest and full of nutrients. So Native American people definitely observed this and used it to their advantage. Another way of hunting before horses, although I do have a horse in this picture, um, was the bison jump. So I don't know if you guys have, have heard of this before, um, but this was a practice regularly used all along the Western and Central uh, Great Plains states by Native American people. And this is um, a great example. This site is called Head Smashed In you know, <laughs> not very sensitive, um, but this is the head smashed in site. And this is actually a 6,000 year old site um, that has tons of fossil evidence of this occurring. So this gathering basin up here is pretty much where Native Americans would use fire to cultivate really um, desirable grasslands uh, that would attract bison into this area. Um, and the fossil record and carbon record in the soil shows us that these areas were burned on a five to seven year interval. So we can kind of understand that these were used every five to seven years. Um, so they would burn this gathering area, bring in the bison and the herd animals, and then either, you know, using fire again to spark some fear into them or dressing up in coyote pelts, to camouflage themselves and scaring them on foot um, they would drive these great bison herds off of a cliff or a ledge, and they would drop, you know, 50 to 100 feet to their death. Uh, the head smashed in kill site over here is where Native Americans would go with clubs to make sure that the animals will, were all dead. <clears throat> but there are bone records hundreds of feet deep. So this was way more than they could even um, consume and process. And then down in this campsite and processing area is where they would handle all the meat that they were gathered. They would smoke and dry it and have enough meat to last their tribes for the entire year, if not multiple years at a time. So they only had to do this every once in a while. But they have found that multiple different tribes would gather in these areas and meet up together to handle these kind of kill sites. Pretty interesting. Fire also played a huge cultural role in, um, in our indigenous people. And one of those things was sweetgrass. I don't know if any of you guys had, had the chance to read the book by Robin Wall Kimmerer called Braiding Sweetgrass, but I highly recommend it if you haven't. Um, fire was used to maintain switchgrass fields um, and cultivate them as, as well as cultivating small woody species that were really flexible. Um, those kind of suckering branches of willow trees and other such species. And they would use these in basket weaving and also in ceremony. Um, sweetgrass was used to purify, um, just like fire is kind of used to purify and cleanse an ecosystem. And without fire, um, they're finding that these switchgrass fields that are such an important cultural legacy are dying off. So what's amazing to me is that we really don't understand um, the kind of pre-Columbian populations of Native Americans and the kind of impacts they might have had on our landscape. So this village here um, had 20,000 residents. Uh, it's called, it's a Mississippi River Valley town, but it had 20,000 residents a thousand years before Columbus came. So the Americas were much more populous than any of us can even imagine. Um, predictions that I've heard range from 90 to 100 million people in North America before um, any European settlers came. So one of the, and here are just a couple more examples and drawings, renderings of uh, North American and Central American towns. But one of the big, big factors that we underestimate is the impact of disease on the continent. So at the time of first contact, smallpox and other diseases came even before European settlers did, and they wiped out up to 90% of the populations. So from 100 million people, um, by the time that the continent actually became, started becoming settled, um, we were down to just six, six million. So all of a sudden, you know, um, European people are coming to the continent and they're like, wow, this is a vast and thriving landscape and there's no one here to claim it. 
Um, this is just another like little offshoot. I just find this really interesting. Um, but the south southeastern um, kind of tribal communities uh, were mound builders. Uh, this is serpent mounds, I believe. Mm, I'm gonna forget. It's like it's in Georgia or you know one of the southern states. Um, but this is serpent mounds, and it's a 1,300 foot long uh, structure that kind of has astrological alignment. Um, but these are one of the things, these are some features in the landscape that we totally look over. Um, in just 2,000 acres of, you know, of southwestern or southeastern, I'm sorry, landscape, there were over 80 mounds in that area. Um, so these areas were super populated and had huge, huge influence from Native American people. Um, and these are something that have gotten plowed under all over the southeastern United States. People had no idea you know they were they were creating farmland they they didn't care um and so we're losing this this legacy and this this historical context so yeah that just comes back to you know um we really just don't understand this this kind of impact that the native people could have had on the landscape um and what kind of influence fire would have as well so at the time um of european settlement in california they really started outlawing Indian burning as being something primitive and childish. So these Native American cultures that used to be in charge of up to 12 million acres of burning all of a sudden became kind of outlawed. Um, the European settlers were definitely very concerned about their herd animals, about their permanent settlements, and they saw, saw Indian burning as a huge risk to them. So we have the, the era of the taming of America, um, really creating it into what European settlers wanted, um, which was something predictable and in control, um, and fire was an outlawed practice. So this, this legacy of suppression that started happening, right, where fire will no longer occur, um, really culminated in the big blow up of 1910. Um, the big blow up of 1910 was one of the worst wildfires in US history at that time. It burned 3 million acres across multiple states and it really scared the US Forestry Service. So the US Forestry Service after this event um, really started claiming a bunch of public lands and they decided with the, I think it was called the Weeks Bill in Congress that burning of all kind would be outlawed on public land in America. So that's when you have the Smokey the Bear campaign. Here's Roosevelt with John Muir. Um, and, you know, fires were halted on, in the park systems across the country. So we're left with this, this cultural pyrophobia, this fear of fire that we all still live with today. You know, and I think part of that pyrophobia is that we just don't understand anymore how fires will affect the landscape, how they'll affect wildlife. So let's explore some impacts on wildlife. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so wildlife have multiple strategies to escape fire, just like the plant communities, they've adapted with fire for a very long time. So we know that all of our herd animals have, you know, great abilities to run and escape fire, especially on a very open landscape. Um, the concern with, with our kind of modern infrastructure is our fences and our barns. Um, animals like pronghorn, for whatever reason, they cannot jump a fence. So that's when we do end up with these modern repercussions that traditionally did not occur. So most fires are anywhere from, um, you know, with wind speed, but uh, 10 to 15 miles per hour. All these animals can easily move that quickly. Pronghorn up to 70 miles per hour. So they're out of the way fast. Then we have all of our bird species, which obviously can fly and escape fire just fine. Even the ground dwelling species, which you think would be a little bit more of concern, have an excellent strategy all their own. They burrow. So soil is a great insulator um, and heat really does not penetrate the soil layer. So escaping into the ground was their method of um, escaping prairie fires. You have the prairie dog, the black-footed ferret and the burrowing owl. So another kind of uh, problem we don't have in our modern context is the prairie dog. 
So the prairie dog uh, would be in prairie dog towns up to 1 million strong um, in certain areas. And the black-footed ferret and the burrowing owl both hunt the prairie dogs in their tunnels. And they also use the prairie dog tunnels to escape fire. So you need the prairie dog in order to have a very like stable and healthy um, prairie community. So this is a crappy photo, but I still love it. Um, you can just see how complex the soil network is out on the prairie and all the refuge that was provided for all those ground animals to escape into in the soil layers. So during my research, I was like, okay, not every animal can escape fire that easily. There has to be some casualties, right? So I looked up the most unsuspecting of all the animals I could think of, and that was the prairie crayfish. So if you guys don't know, on like healthy prairies, there are crayfish that are terrestrial and they live in the ground. And I'm like, of all things that should get burned up, right? Well, no, it doesn't. So um, the prairie crayfish actually dig six to eight foot deep branching tunnels into the soil until they can tap into a water table, um, which I personally felt was amazing. You can see these chimneys here, which is a sign that prairie crayfish are living um, on your landscape. But even more interesting, snakes and other reptiles that also have a hard time escaping fire use these crayfish holes to um, escape the flames as well. So look at that. Um, also, during my research, I learned that all these animal populations actually increase under fire because it returns um, diverse plant communities and more nutrients to the soil. It actually increases all these animal populations. So if there has to be a casualty and an animal of concern during a fire event, it is the eggs and young hatchlings of ground dwelling birds. These are the ones that have a hard time escaping, as you can imagine, um, because they're not old enough to do so. Um, but that is probably one of the reasons why populations of these animals were a million strong, because they did have to experience some losses um, during, pred during predation and um, disaster events. So, all in all, you have a lot of animal adaptation to fire. Um, as you can see, and I've experienced this on the burns that I've been on, you can actually stand upwind of a fire, like right behind it, and be a foot away and not be, you know, concerned at all. As you can see, this cattle, um, this cow in this picture is just slowly wandering upwind of the fire. It's traveling in the, in the opposite direction. So animals are just as smart um, and can really interpret the risk of that situation. And some animals even take advantage. So in the picture to the right is the firehawk of Australia. And the firehawks are actually a group of birds. Um, most of them are actually kites, I believe, um, and different types of raptors, but they use fire. So they'll pick up burning sticks and transport those sticks up to a kilometer away and start their own fire. Uh, to flush prey animals from that system. So they'll flush lizards and mice and rabbits and hunt that way. So we are not the only animals that use fire to our advantage. So what are the other impacts on the landscape in general? What can we better understand so that we don't have such a pyrophobic culture? Well, you can fight fire with fire. So to prevent wildfire, we set fire in, in prescribed burns to really manage the ecosystem. Over here, once again, we're looking at the fast drop forest on the right. Um, the only area of the forest that survived the 2011 wildfire was the area that had recently been burned. So by, by doing controlled fires and managing that fuel load, um, the fire you know, became suppressed when it went into that area. It started burning very low and very mild and those trees and um, climax vegetation were actually able to survive. So that is some of the only remaining vegetation on Bastrop State Park. State Park. So in general, as you can see in this picture, um, a fire that moves through the grassland, it doesn't burn um, hot enough or long enough to really kill off the surface vegetation and these are all bunch grasses, and you can see that their bunch still remains and they're going to return. 
So fires actually increase perennial bunch grasses and they increase perennial flowering species as well, stabilizing that environment. Um, and woody trees and shrubs decrease. The reason why perennials are able to come back so easily from fire is because prairie species have very extensive um, root systems adapted to these sort of pressures. So because there is so much heat and drought and risk above ground, um, they spend a lot of time building root systems. Some prairie species extend up to 20 feet into the soil. And one of the deepest rooting species that you can see in this chart is the prairie blazing star or ladris. And this is its root system here. So you can imagine if all the surface vegetation burns off, this kind of potato-like storage organ is all of its uh, stored resources, water and nutrients to ha have returned growth. Um, another major challenge, as I'm sure a lot of you guys know, if you have ever been on all out on prairies or on ranches is woody encroachment of our grasslands. Um, so the, the species of greatest kind of concern is juniper or cedar, eastern red cedar we also call it. And this is a major threat to the imperiled grassland ecosystem. So grasslands in general um, have, you know, are only 1% of their, their traditional um, kind of range is left now. Uh, so any threat to them is something of major concern. Um, and juniper is one of the worst cases. So normally juniper grows on rocky outcrops a little bit higher in elevation and avoids the prairie because it's actually very intolerant to fire. Um, and the problem when you have a lot of juniper is you're going to suppress those bunch grasses. You're going to displace wildlife that depended on all those flowering species. And you're going to alter that fire regime. Um, juniper crowded areas actually reduce stream flow by up to 30 to 40 percent because they're such water suckers. Um, but there's been a lot of success controlling these guys with fire. So the strategy is to basically cut around the perimeter of juniper groves, um, take down those trees to create a burn break, you know, so where the fire kind of stops. And they stack those cut trees underneath the really dense areas of juniper to create a lot of fuel. And this fire, when it is start, burns really hot for a very long time um, and kills off that standing vegetation. So they've had a lot of success with this. Up to 15 years later, the grassland is still remaining, and they've seen up to 65% increase of bird species. You also have a lot of dormancy of seeds in fire um, dependent ecosystems. So this is a coral bean, which is a flowering species. I don't think a lot of you guys would be familiar with that. But if you know mountain laurel from the hill country, they also have these red seeds um, that, are, that require fire in order to germinate. And the same thing is true with pine forest. So pine forests love being burned on a regular interval every two to three years is really what they, what kind of fire they love. Um, and, and pine seeds require fire to break seed dormancy. So they will not germinate without um, a burn. Also, you know, a strategy that Native Americans practice that I really wanna emphasize is burning in a mosaic pattern. Um, so when you do do a controlled burn or a prescribed burn, uh, things will naturally, um, like cooler or damper areas, not burn. When the fire gets to the woodland edge, it kind of stops and let that occur. So you're burning in a mosaic pattern that allows refuge for different wildlife and invertebrates and insects to escape to. Um, so that's an important, you know, cultural legacy of Native Americans that they use burning in small areas and allowing a lot of refuges to occur. That way you have a diversity of um, <clears throat> responses in the plant community. So burning at different times of year, burning at different intensities and um, burning in different areas allows a lot of diversity of uh, vegetation to return. Um, so burning at different times of year obviously is going to favor one plant community over the other and plants influence the rest of the food chain. So if you have the right plants, you have the right insects, you have the right birds and everything else that comes with that. Um, so I just want to emphasize that diversity promotes diversity in burning. The other great thing that fire does is it really enhances the carbon cycle. 
Um, so this was one of my concerns when I first, you know, started researching fire is aren't you losing so much carbon when you're burning off all that standing vegetation? Well, that is true, but frequent low intensity fires don't burn off that much vegetation, right? It's only those kind of regime changing disaster level events that um, cause carbon issues. So those low intensity fires actually return carbon to the soil and they create charcoal. And charcoal is an amazing soil amendment because it actually binds um, carbon to the soil in a long lasting compound that ends up being uh, one of the best things you can do for long-term soil uh, fertility. So there's a very famous example in the Amazon rainforest called Terra Preta. And this is a very dark, organically rich soil layer that is man-made. So back during, uh, you know, uh, hunter kind of gatherer time periods, long time ago, thousands and thousands of years, uh, the Native American people in the Amazon actually cultivated the forest, much like, you know, kind of the nut crops and orchards that I was talking about earlier. And they used their own human waste and their waste product from their foods. And they burned, um, they burned all, all that, you know, all that stuff and created charcoal. And they used that biochar and they returned it to the forest and spread it out like a fertilizer. So these soil layers in the Amazon are dark and fertile and rich and full of carbon and full of fungi and beneficial bacteria compared to the normal Amazon forest that didn't experience this kind of cultivation. So still today, they, they um, kind of mine terra preta and they use that as a soil amendment. So you can take soil from the Amazon, put it into your garden, and all of a sudden you're returning all this like microbial life and carbon to the soil and facilitating um, a bunch of cool um, soil cycles. So pretty amazing what carbon can do for the soil. So from Native American people, we inherited this cultural legacy of fire. We inherited fire dependent ecosystems um, and forests. And we can use this knowledge to also cultivate low severity fires that increase biodiversity and increase that kind of mosaic uh, diversity out there. Um, or we can, we can be part of the problem, right? And, and not help and cause wildfires that are high severity that, that kill off biodiversity and climax plant communities and cause lots of problems for us as well. So fire is a, a tool that can be used to enhance our ecosystems or to destroy them. And that's really our choice. The end. Thank you, Megan. Uh, just fascinating. And uh, you have a, a question that came in from Joe Lynn. Um, to what extent does the present day prescribed fire program mimic the ancient indigenous people's fire patterns? I think, you know, right off the bat, my um, response is not enough. So I definitely think like modern day, we're learning a lot more um, looking backwards on these practices than we have, um, you know, in the recent past. Um, especially since 1910, like we've evolved so much. No longer does the Forest Service suppress fires. They're really starting to use that as a tool in forestry management. We learned that during Yellowstone, um, the Yellowstone fires. So I think we're learning a lot more, but still we're not burning enough. And I think that's still our pyrophobic culture that really is afraid of fire and what it can do. Um, and therefore we are causing the wildfires, right? Um, but I think we're mimicking that a lot more. Any other questions, guys? Sorry, I went through that so fast. I was nervous. Yeah, OK. There was Ryan, uh, says, uh, we've discussed this increased rate of burning as an established indigenous process, but the human impact portion clearly began at some point uh, in prehistory. Is there any basis for suspecting that extinctions were caused by the initial onset of anthropogenic burning in North America? Yeah, so the, there is, um, 
You know, there is a major theory, right, that um, extinction of the megafauna around 12,500 years ago occurred because of Native American hunting. Um, but there is another theory, which I kind of believe more in, um, that there was a major environmental disaster that occurred around that point that caused that major environmental shift from ice age to planetary warming. Um, and so I believe that it was more attributed to a natural disaster along the lines of a comet or an asteroid hitting the planet around that time that caused fires and burning in kind of the, the fossil record. But I think that was a natural disaster rather than a human caused one personally. Um, and that theory is called the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis if you wanna read more about it. Okay, another question from Lori. What needs to be done to convince people that it is good and not a threat to our system? I think it's all about education. That's why I did this presentation today, um, because I think there's just still a lot of fear in our culture. Um, and until we do more fires more frequently and get people used to the idea again, that fear is going to remain. And the problem with that fear is it's actually increased by our neglect, right? Because our neglect of burning is what causes the wildfires. So I think the more that we can create education events around fire in our own communities um, is the opportunity to start reversing that legacy. Great, okay. Uh, we got, have a question from Betsy. Uh, can you address the Yellowstone fires more? Yeah. So to the yeah. fire, she says. Yeah, so Yellowstone was a disaster level event, right? Um, that was also following all those years of suppression in the park that led to those fuel buildup. Um, and they had some major repercussions because of that. So I think for at least a few years after the fire, they had major problems. Um, most of the animals had left the park uh, because the vegetation was completely gone. Um, and the water cycles were affected. Uh, but after a few years, um, once regrowth began to happen and, and the vegetation came back, the animals came back in larger numbers than they'd ever been before. Uh, so yes, the fires were a disaster level event um, that shouldn't have happened if controlled burns were occurring, uh, but they did actually lead to better policies and higher animal populations in the long run. And I don't know about a museum. I've never been myself. Becca says, thanks, Megan. You've talked a lot about ancient and historic fire practices among indigenous peoples. Could you discuss a bit? I'm sorry, I'm frozen up. I'm frozen up here. Uh, Very good. Almost there. Mm -hmm. I think I see it. Um, can you discuss a bit more on how contemporary indigenous communities are using fire? Right? I think that's it. Let's see. Yes, yes, that's it. Okay. Um, so they're definitely doing this in California, uh, but there are groups of indigenous people that are banding together. And I think I have a website. Let me see. Oops. Uh, hold on. Um, okay, I'm not sure. But it's called the Indigenous People uh, Burning Network. Um, but basically groups of Indigenous people are starting to band together to help fire practitioners in their local areas um, conduct Indigenous burning methods. Um, so they call themselves fire starters instead of firefighters. Um, and it's like a whole thing, but you can read more about that in the Indigenous uh, Peoples and Fire website. Anne has a question. What is the prescribed fire prescription for managing prairies? So that is completely dependent on your goals and your prairie. 
Um, so basically, you really have to be an observer and an, an interpreter yourself and make smart, intelligent decisions um, based on your own weather patterns, um, the kind of plant communities you'd like to support, um, and your local area. So it's going to be um, an intelligent decision that you have to go out um, and look yourself because no one size fits all is going to um, work for any specific place. But in general, um, it seems like Native American people burned one to once every five years and somewhere in that range, two to three years is a good balance. Um, and I would suggest alternating those late fall and early spring burns. And those, those kind of burns are very preventative, right? So they kind of take off the dead fuel load so you don't have summer burn problems, um, which can get out of control. But definitely, you know, um, practice different methods over small areas. That way you're not making any large scale impact that you don't want to have. So that's what I'd recommend. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, and uh, she had a follow-up question, the best time to burn due to forbs, et cetera. So it's, but from what I'm understanding, it's not really related to the type of plant, it's more the specifics of the prairie? Well, yes, and um, as far as forb production goes, I would probably recommend the late fall, um, just because a lot of our species are actually biennials, which means that they grow in the fall. So helping clear off um, dead standing vegetation to allow sunlight um, down to the, the forest floor or the prairie floor um, and allowing more nutrients will actually help the establishment of those biennial species that grow in the fall and uh, promote that spring flowering. So if you're doing an early spring uh, burn, you might risk burning off some of those basil rosettes, you know, that have been developing all of fall and might have an impact on your wildflower community. So I would suggest the late fall burn if you really want a lot of flowers. All right, let's go ahead and get this question from Susan. And uh, we have may have multiple people that have this. Uh, can you share your contact information? Great presentation, Megan. Oh, and yes. <laughs> say a lot of people, uh, I'm sure you've seen in the chat, Megan, a lot of people comment on how great this presentation has been. Oh, okay. No, I haven't read them all yet, but um, my bad. I totally forgot that. And I also just noticed that my class section is still on this slide. <laughs> Sorry. But yeah, my name is Megan Peoples. So you can um, contact me at meganpeoples at gmail.com um, if you have any comments or questions or would like any of my sources. We have a thank you. Uh, earlier in the presentation, uh, one of our folks recommended a book called 1941. Uh, yeah. are, um, echoing that uh, sentiment. Um, uh, thank you for that book. And it's highly recommended. Also, any books by Gregory. Uh, I may, may not be pronouncing it right. Cajete. Mm -hmm. I would but, love to look into that one. Science. I've 1491, but I haven't done Native Science. That sounds very interesting. Um, I have another, I think it was a direct message that didn't go to the overall group, but how can one manage a prescribed burn in slightly urban areas? So that's a great question. Um, I know that the Fort Worth uh, Botanic Garden conducted a burn like in the center of downtown Fort Worth. And so if they're able to do it, so are you. Um, but one of the main concerns is smoke, right? You don't want smoke any over any like public uh, roadways because, because that causes a lot of concern. And you also have to let your local authorities know so that when people call in freaking out that there's a fire, they know how to address that. So those are the two big things. You want um, to wait until the wind direction favors the smoke going away from roadways, right? Because you, you don't want to cause any hazard. And then the other thing is you create a very large burn break. A burn break is an area of very low fuel. So basically bare dirt um, or a closely mowed area that stops the fire because it doesn't have any fuel. Um, so giving a good healthy um, burn break, which can be up to you know 10 to 20 feet wide, um, stops the fire um, from going to, into an, any urban area. You can also help reduce fuel loads by cutting down trees or mowing a little bit. Um, 
But other than that, fires in urban areas are very, very possible and can be under complete control as long as the conditions are right. On the subject of smoke, uh, another book uh, somebody recommended is called Bad Smoke, Good Smoke by John Erickson. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'll look into that one too. Seeing lots more excellence looking through here for more questions. Uh, we have a comment from Diane saying, in Flower Man, we conduct our prairie burn right in the middle of a very urban area with houses adjoining the area. Lots of education ahead of time to a community. That's the way to do it. And then you'll start getting the community on your side when they see the results of that fire and know that that fire is actually making their homes safer in the long run. Speaking of mounds, uh, as in flower mound, uh, Becca earlier in the presentation shared a link back when you were talking about mounds uh, to uh, the uh, Serpent Mound website. So that's a, a interesting reference. That's from. Thank you so much because I forgot what state that was in. That's so embarrassing, but um, super interesting oh. place. Yeah, that's in Ohio history. Ohio. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, I hope we didn't miss anything. Uh, thank you so much, Megan, and thank you everybody who joined us. We hope to see many of you at our next Master Naturalist Present talk, which should be February. So be on the lookout for that to be advertised in a few weeks. And uh, as a reminder, uh, many of you already know this, we have recordings from many of our past presentations in a YouTube playlist which is accessible from uh, the Dallas Library's website, dallaslibrary.org slash pond, P-O-N-D. Uh, and uh, we will be getting this presentation up on that playlist here within the next few days. And so uh, if you wanna go back and, and review it, or uh, uh, if you wanna share that for people who you think may enjoy the presentation, but have missed it today. So, uh, any final thoughts, Megan? No, I think I, I covered a lot. <laughs> you have. So, uh, and uh, we, we have a comment from Vicki, uh, and I'll highlight it because she's joining us from the Balcones Canyonland chapter in Austin. So uh, we've, got a, we've got some viewers from, from all around. Very cool. Thanks, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yes, thank you, guys.